We want to welcome everyone to the services of the Church of Christ here in Santa Paula this morning. Uh, thank to those that are in the audience today that have come out to worship God. And thank you that are on the podcast for tuning in to us and worshiping God with us through that. Our lesson this morning is going to be given to us by Brother Bob Perez, and uh, we look forward to that lesson. God bless. I asked Asher to turn off the lights so you could see the funny picture of me yesterday. But uh, anyways, yesterday uh, was the alumni baseball game at Pepperdine University. And uh, we get to play against the Division I Pepperdine University baseball team. And I say we, I guess I'm one of the older guys. And one of the guys came up to me and says, thank you for representing the 60-year-olds. Good. <laughs> I forgot. So anyways, that's me. I had my gear on right before I was going out to pitch, and I was saying, yikes. These guys were throwing 90-mile-an-hour fastballs. I'm 62 years old. And the guy that was pitching hadn't pitched in a while, and he was 25 years old, and he was throwing heat, and he had his fiance there, so I think he threw his arm out. He couldn't throw a strike. And the reason why I have the picture of the umpire, he threw a curveball, went over the batter's head, it curved down and hit the umpire in the leg, and he got mad at me because I couldn't catch the ball. And then he did it again and hit the umpire again. And I said, well, I turned around to him, I said, well, the, bat, the pitcher has a bad arm. He goes, it's not on him. In other words, he's saying, it's your fault because you can't catch. So I wanted to just tell you, that's what I went through yesterday, and it relates to the sermon about... Um, what do you do when things go south? In other words, the guy couldn't throw a strike. The umpire was mad at me. I couldn't react and catch the ball. And it was the longest half an inning I ever experienced. I think it was a half hour. And oh, well, I was exhausted and took myself out of the game after three outs. That's it. So, and even, uh, so we even had to substitute, get a relief pitcher. He came in and he hit the batter. <laughs> in the foot, and then he got mad at the umpire for letting him go to first, because in baseball, if you hit the batter, you get a free base, right? He goes, it's an alumni game, let him hit. And they got an argument, and the ump was still mad at me. <laughs> so things were going south, and then I got nervous, because I was like, I can't catch anymore. So I know next year I'm not playing, okay? Please don't let me play. There's a point where you have to just give it up. So um, it does relate to uh, the sermon, because... Um, the concept of, hey, I tried. We have to try. And sometimes things don't go right, right? And so I guess the, behind the text that we're talking about today is what do you do? What is your attitude like in your life when things go south? Okay, think about that. And think about the concept of trying. And a few people came up to me and said, hey, I really appreciate that you were in there at your age. And uh, I think they were rubbing it in a little bit. <laughs> but anyways, I, I gave it a shot. So there I am. Um, uh, is that yeah. a minor B picture of you? A what? Minor B. Yeah, yeah. You look like an eight or nine year old. Yeah, he does. Yeah. No, that was yesterday, right? Yeah. Sam took that picture, so she said, turn it around. So it does look funny with all that gear on. So um, that was the game. It was a beautiful day, and it was a beautiful experience. So um, the reason why I uh, wanted to read this song, because, you know, when you are busy, you're doing something fun. I usually spend the whole day Saturday preparing my sermon, and I just thought, well, I don't want to preach too much, but this song encapsulates or summarizes what First Peter's about. He starts to telling us what God has done for us, and basically that song says, and I thought of Patsy, and I don't want to cry, I have a living hope. Amen? Amen. I have a future. Amen. That's verses 7 through 9 of 1 Peter 1, if you turn there, because I'm going to focus in on verses 10 through 12. And Peter's writing to the church. He says, you have a living hope, an inheritance in heaven, because Jesus resurrected from the dead. He goes to their hindsight. And then he says, here's your future in verses 7 through 9. And it's a beautiful future that we're going to have, like he said, like Ray said in John 14 it is, where he says, you're going to have a mansion, a room in the mansion in heaven waiting for you. In verses 7 through 9, he talks about that. When you go through trials, when you go through what I did yesterday, and uh, are suffering a little bit, 
he tells you, these trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. So what he's talking about is the future. You have trials in your life that you're sitting here, that something's going to happen down the line. And those of us that have been in life for a while have been through these trials, but that doesn't mean they're over. And he's trying to encourage the church to stay faithful. And he says, the reason why we stay faithful, because we have a living hope. Jesus resurrected from the dead. And then he says, and he talks about, though you do not see him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And then here's the second part of this little song right here. When I said, God has delivered me from what? He says it in verse 9b. He says, um, you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your faith. And what is the goal of our faith? Eternal life. The salvation of your souls, eternal life. That's what the song says, God has delivered me. He's delivered us from, I guess, the pit of hell because we are humble enough to accept his message, amen? So I just wanted to say that's what the song's about and it popped in my mind. So instead of me giving you an exegesis and a background, this is it. That's what 1 Peter chapter 1, it's a symphony, it's a song of praise to remind us what God has done for us. Amen? Amen. So, here's the text that I wanted to focus on. It's related to our New Testament series. What is our attitude when it comes to studying the Bible? I know I've had some people say, but Mr. Perez, I want to study the Bible with you because I read it and my brain's like a sift. Everything goes in it and comes out the other end or you just don't get it. It's too deep. And, and look what even the prophet struggled with this. He says, <laughs> concerning this salvation, concerning this eternal life, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you that we have in 2023, look what it says. Here's my first point. What did they do? Did they kick back and do nothing? They searched intently. I take Hebrew class. I'm in a Hebrew class right now. I'm taking it as an auditor. And guess what everyone does in that class? We search intently, taking these exams and studying Hebrew and all this stuff. And it's hard. That's what the prophets did. They searched intently and with greatest care. They didn't wing it. <laughs> Once in a while, we have to wing it. But they did not do that because they were trying to find what was the hope and the future for Israel. And Peter answers that. So my point number one, search intently the scriptures. Amen? Because not only does it affect this promise is for you, but it's also for your children and those who are far off. And that's what I'm preaching at my mom's funeral in a couple of weeks. That's from Acts chapter two, chapter two, verse 39. That's right after this famous scripture that says, repent and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of sin so that you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter says, and this promise is for you. And if you don't think it's for you, it's gonna be for your children and those who are far off, your great grandchildren. And that's how, that's how things change. Your decision right now affects the next generation. And that was written 2000 years ago. Powerful text. So he says, they search intently with the greatest care. So that's my first point, search intently. Keep coming, keep following God, amen? Very simple thing to do, but it's not easy. So the concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the greatest care that has come to you, searched intently. Very simple text, verse. The next one is, I'm a tryhard. You know what a tryhard is? Playing in the alumni game, I, Liz had to force me to stay home Friday at five in the morning to go to the gym and pump some iron and do some squats so that I can lift weights to get ready for Saturday's game. But I happened to be playing 18 holes of golf that same morning with all these guys that came out of town. And she goes, you're gonna go to the game hurt, stay home. So I had to sneak back into the house and she caught me and I stayed home. And then I took my Hebrew, to, I went on a Hebrew conference to turn our, you know, a Hebrew class session. We were studying Hebrew because I had an exam and I came back from playing 18 holes of golf and I was exhausted. I was falling asleep during the exam. So I'm a tryhard. I'm going to do all those things. And God says we need to be tryhards when it comes to searching God's word. Amen. Amen. 
Look what there it says right there. Trying to find out the time and circumstances. So I thought that was interesting. They were trying to pinpoint when is this all going to happen in the Old Testament. And guess what the good news is? It happened. It already happened. Amen. Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ. I thought that was interesting. This is Peter the Apostle. He understood it because he experienced the gospel right before his very face. Jesus died on the cross. And what did he do? Under pressure. When things went south. He denied Jesus three times. Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing to when he predicted. And here's the answer to this big search intention. This search or this quest when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection, the glories. John's gospel is called the book of signs and the book of glories. And the book of glories means it's the resurrection when he was glorified. And Peter is answering, answering that. So my two points, just in case you miss it, search, amen? Intently, with greatest care, that's important. And be a tryhard. You may not be the best gifted person in ter terms of trying, but God, God wants our hearts to try our best. Amen? I believe that. We don't have to be perfect, but we just want to keep trying. So thank you for trying and being here. So search and try. Now, here's the beautiful result of trying. Look at the next verse, verse 12. It was revealed to them. This is what was revealed to them. Not all the answers. It relates to attitude. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. They went from selfish, maybe servants possibly, to selfless. And don't we need to be people that are selfless? It's hard to do that. Even when your spouse tells you, would you do this for me? And then we have that stubborn streak. Maybe, okay, I have that stubborn streak and I ain't gonna listen to anybody. And then you think about it and you think about this verse and then wait a second, I'm a preacher. It was revealed to them that they were not selfish. Basically, it was what he's telling them. Not self-serving not self -serving themselves or they were not serving themselves. And look what he says, but you. It's what Ramon did. He went out of his way and skipped his birthday and went to see Patsy, not knowing that that would be the day before she passed away. And he told me, he texted me that he was reading all the beautiful cards that some of us wrote to her at the Bible study Wednesday night. And he was reading it to her and she was kind of being revived in her spirit, listening to the people who wrote those cards. So it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you when they spoke of the things. And look what he says. He gives the answer to these prophets who searched so hard about. Here's the answer that have now been told to you by those who did what? He says it very clearly, who preached the gospel to you. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus had occurred, and Peter said, it has happened right before our face. This Jesus who came was the Messiah. He did suffer, and he was resurrected, and he's writing to the church, okay, before you get persecuted by these Romans, during the time of Nero, who killed the apostle Paul, probably, and Herod beheaded James, and Peter was in Rome, he says, if you read chapter 5 of 1 Peter, he says, she who is in Babylon, he's referring to Rome. And Babylon represents a city that's so totally set against God. So for those of you in Hollywood, to write, name a movie Babylon, I know what you were doing. I just had to say that as a preacher. So, been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you. And look what he said. Here's why I said, if you're a try hard, if you search diligently, you still don't get it. Sometimes we need help. Amen? Who is it or what is it that gives us help? And he says it right there in the text. The Holy Spirit. Yep, the Holy Spirit. The preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And it was mentioned in the Bible study the other night, someone may knock on your door. Maybe someone in your have an opportunity to preach the gospel and you don't know the answers. Maybe the Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom step by step, little by little, to say the right things at the right time. 
So staying in his word and being preparing yourself, you never know when you're going to get that opportunity. So my three points, search, try, and be selfless. Amen? Very simple. And then the, ad- the last one has to do with attitude, okay? When the pitcher came in, the relief pitcher came in, and I was struggling with that first pitcher, and he finally admitted, he says, my arm is hurting terrible, I have to go up. And they put the other guy in. He came in, hit the first batter, argued with the umpire, and then argued every pitch that was a strike. There was a ball. I hope he hears this. I, he was throwing ball. He wasn't throwing strikes. And he was arguing with the umpire. And, and then I'm, I'm sitting there. It's been about a half hour. And it affected the attitude. I was wondering, why is he doing that? Why is he arguing with the umpire? And I went and told the umpire after the game, I'm sorry about what went down, that I couldn't catch. I felt bad, but the other guy argued with you. And he goes, oh, I'm just used to it. I go, well, it's not right. We're at Pepperdine University, and that's injustice. And he turned around and said, thank you for saying that to me. So even the angels long to look into it. And I want to end this sermon with my favorite little, and I'm going to cry when I say this. I want to read the verse from the message, the last part. Do you realize how fortunate you are? I love that. Angels would have loved or have given anything to be in on this. And you are in on this. So yesterday I was at the Pepperdine baseball game. This is my last illustration. And there's our tryhards. These are 60-year-old guys in the 1982 baseball team that lost to Stanford to go to the College World Series. There's Doug Fritz. Ralph Sheffield was a bad dude. The little African-American guy. He was the best player I've ever seen. You got Dave Rhodes, we used to call him Royalty. He was fast, like the road runner. And then Jimmy Jones, and then there's me. And then next to me is my grandson. He's growing too tall. (laughs) So here's the blessing. Remember what I said, even angels long to be in on this? How fortunate you are to be in on this? So you don't realize the blessings that we have until something happens, what happened to me and Asher yesterday. So after the game, they told us that they would, we can get a free baseball cap. Anyone that played, and I was dumb enough to say, oh, just give me anyone. So I got the ugliest orange baseball cap that you can get. And then Sam goes, Bob, they were giving out cool hats. They had these ones that looked like, what were they, military? And then they had red, white, and blue American, and I got the dumbest hat, and I go, oh, I didn't know that. So I got this ugly orange hat, so I have to wear it. So Asher and I, I go, I go, why don't you go ask the coach if we can get another one? So I go, oh, okay. So I went and asked Rick, could I get a, a hat for my grandson? He goes, meet me after the game. So we go into the clubhouse. We go walk in there. And then he told us we can the jersey that I was wearing, which was my number, he goes, you can actually keep them. But I took it off and put it on the fence, not realizing I could keep it. Went down to the locker room. Asher walks down with me in the, to get a hat with the coach. And we go into the, I guess it's like a candy store every single hat, all these extra hats, and then I'm looking and saying, man, I want another one. But I didn't want to be greedy. So I go, Asher, go get my jersey. He goes out there, it's gone. Someone else took it by then. Because they gave it to the whole team. There was about 40 guys there. So he grabbed it, Asher came in, and then he goes, here, Asher, which one you want? And he gives him the pick of the litter. And I'm sitting there going, man, did I blow it. And I had that nice orange cap there. So he goes, Asher, try this one on. And it was a beautiful, I wish he would have brought it, but he had a beautiful hat. And he goes, well, it's a little too tight. Man. So he goes, he goes, how about this one? He goes, perfect. And then he goes up to Asher. And this is, relates to blessed to be in on it. Remember what the angels, they are in on it. He goes up to him. And I didn't know he did this. He went in and goes, shh. And he gave him another ball cap. He got two. And then, this, and then he says, oh, by the way, you can go get a jersey. And so Asher went out and got a jersey. And I was just like, it made me want to cry. And then I thought, man, I want another hat. <laughs> I started getting greedy. <laughs> but anyways, I just wanted to say that uh, my three last points here, three takeaways is uh, search with all your heart. Amen? Search the scriptures. You're doing the right thing by coming to church today. And try. We may not be perfect, but keep trying. Amen? With all the trials we have, some of it's on ourselves. And the other one is be selfless. Okay, at times we get stubborn, but I guess my favorite story is uh, when Curly, sorry, the three stooges I grew up with, he was stubborn. And Mo would carry, he said, I'm not going camping no matter what you say. And then what would Mo do? He hit him over the head with a frying pan. 
because you're going camping and Curly starts singing a camping we will go, camping we will go, hi ho the dairy, camping we will go. So we're going to sing this song, amen. Kenny, would you lead us in the closing song? If you're not a Christian, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You too on that. Okay. So Kenny. Jesus.